We've got uh, four people from the MFA Multidisciplinary Design. This is a course I run at the University of Ulster. Um, we try to teach things that are useful. Um, you might know some of our graduates, Paddy Donnelly, Lee Monroe, uh, Johnny Campbell, Danny Turley, Rory McCall, all have gone on to do great things. And I like to think that that's because we help them in some small, tiny, tiny way. Uh, they're all great, um, and we hopefully have helped to make them greater. So our speakers tonight, we have David Turner. Uh, he's going to be doing a talk called Collaboratively Speaking. Johnny Hall will be talking about the designer entrepreneur. We'll then have a short break. I like to call it a wee break. Uh, it's a wee break if you want to have a wee. It's also a wee break if you want to get a drink. And then we'll come back. That'll be about 15, 20 minutes, that break. Then we'll come back and we'll have Pauline Clancy, who'll be talking about language and typography, and Carl Gawley, who'll be doing a, I can only describe as, you've seen, have you seen Pecha Kucha? Yes? OK. It's like Pecha Kucha, but if you just snorted a couple of lines of cocaine, it's really fast. And it's a very good talk. And, and we thought we should share this amongst a bigger audience than just the people on the MA. So without further ado, first up, we have David. So David joined us on the MFA from our IMD course. Some of you are probably on IMD, or some of you maybe studied on IMD. Whilst on the MFA, he, he, his focus has been on the development of digital products. He's working on a number of products, including Get Invited, which is a ticketing system that is going to wipe the floor with Eventbrite. Uh, he's also working on Simply Written, a web-based service for writers. And David's going to talk about collaboration at the heart of the creative process. So give it up for David Turner. Thank you. Thanks. So, as Chris said, um, I'm a student on the master's course on my second year. And over the past year and a half, I've been working with a lot of people on the services that I've been providing. And it's been interesting for me because previously everything I've done has either been by myself or with people, but not really collaborating with them. So I thought I'd share some of the stuff that I've learned over the past year and a half of going through this process. So there's a few things I want to talk about. The first is... Um, what is collaboration? I'm sure most of you know what it is, but just in case there's a few people that don't. Why you'd want to collaborate with people, and how you'd go about collaborating with people. Um, so first up is, what is collaboration? And at its very core, it's teamwork. It's working with people, bringing people together to create things. But it's also about bringing together a collection of skills. You know, if you're a developer, you don't want to bring in a load of people that do the same thing as you. You want to bring in people that complement that and augment that. It's also about balance. You want to bring in people that you don't want to have an un, an, a weird balance of people. So you don't want to have too many developers or too many designers. You want to make sure that they're able to work together and no one's overworked, no one's underworked. Everyone's able to achieve a goal. And it's about delegation as well, making sure that the right person's working on the right task. And whenever I've been looking at or collaboration, an awful lot of it focuses on what I've been doing. And I wanted to take a couple of examples and look at what's out there in other areas of the world. And the one that really resonated with me was the idea that music's collaboration. You can see here three examples of the, or three of the Goldman variations by Bach. And throughout it, you can see there's a load of different balances. You can see beginnings, middles, and ends. And you can see that there's bits where things flow. You can see that there's a structure the entire way through. And that happens because you're able to bring together a collection of people that are really talented at a specific thing. You know, an orchestra isn't just woodwind, it's brass, percussion, string. And you wouldn't get the same effect if it was just one of those or a couple of them. You need the entirety of it to really produce something magical. But it's not enough to just bring together people that have fantastic talents. You need to bring together people that care. And an example for me is the band Pink Floyd with the album Dark Side of the Moon. Um, it, whenever they were working on this, they really pushed the boundaries of what you could do with sound at the time. And whenever they realized that their event was going to be announced and their music was going to be played over a public announcement system, they boycotted their own event because the quality of the music wouldn't be up to their standards. And they didn't want to be associated with that. I quite like that because it shows that you care about what you're doing and you don't want to be tainted by low quality products. So why would you want to collaborate with people? The first point for me really is bringing people with different skills together. I'm a developer, I program stuff. I can do some design, 
but there's people that are much more talented at that than me. So working with them allows me to create better things. The idea of Gestalt, that by bringing together two people, they can do more as a team than they'd be able to do as two individuals. Again, the idea of delegation. I'm quite good at programming, but I'm not so good at design. So by being able to work with someone that can handle that, I'm able to focus on what I'm good at. And the idea of support, that if something goes wrong, if I have to handle something else, that things aren't going to stagnate and die because I can rely on that other person or the rest of that team to carry on for me. And I wanted to dig a little bit into these. So the first one I wanted to look at was skills. Whenever I was talking with one of my friends that I've been collaborating with on Simply Written, they came up, or came up with this fantastic statement that we're like colors and those inner parts define us. Whenever we mix them, we make beautiful things, but if it's just me, then it's not so nice. And that really resonated with me. Whenever you're working with color, you can do something really nice with the color blue. Whenever you're working with red, you can create something really nice with the color red. But if you start mixing those two colors, you get a whole range of variation, things that are different, things that you couldn't achieve with just one color. And the, secondly, the idea of Gestalt. This is me working by myself. You know, I can do only so much. This is me working with Kyle on Simply Re or Get Invited. You know, because we're working together, we're able to bounce ideas off of each other, come up with new things that we otherwise wouldn't have been able to do. And this is three people working together. Because they're working together as a closely knit team, because they care about what they're doing, they're able to push each other to do that a little bit more. And it allows them to create something better than they'd have been able to do individually. So how do you go about collaborating? Whenever I came about this, you know, I'd always worked by myself. I'd always relied upon myself to do things. And I realized that you know, if I'm going to bring in people to work with me, that's not going to really work. There's no point in me bringing in people if I'm doing everything myself. So I needed to take a look at what skills I could bring to the table, what skills I needed to be brought to the table by other people, and how that would work. So the first thing I identified was that I really needed someone to come in that could handle the design side of things. You know, that's my weakest area when it comes to building something. I needed someone that could handle development. That would be me. But I kind of looked at this, and this is where most people I've seen um, in my time in IMD, this is where they'd stop. You know, you've got someone that can design the thing, you've got someone that can make the thing. And I realized that it's not quite enough. What I really needed was someone that could ensure that I had some form of direction. Someone that kept me focused and kept the team focused so that we would be able to push towards what we wanted to make rather than getting sidetracked by ideas and nice to have things that really didn't hone in on what we wanted to provide. So you can see here we've got design, development, and direction. Three fantastic areas of knowledge. But it doesn't work like this. You don't have a designer, you don't have a developer, and a direct, someone directing you, just individually. They come together, their skills overlap. So you're able to throw ideas at each other, you're able to communicate, talk, and through doing this, you're able to push yourself to do better. And the key advantage of this, in addition to being able to bounce ideas off of each other and push each other to do better, is that you've got this flexibility in what you do. So the designer can take some time out to work on something else. The other two members of the team can keep working. Something might happen and the guy running the show needs to step back for a little bit. Maybe he's got another project on the go. Or the designer might get, or developer might get a little bit burnt out and need to take time out just to unwind. Whenever I've spoken about collaboration previously, I've looked at things and this is where I'd normally have stopped. You know, you've got this whole what is team or what is collaboration? Why would you want to collaborate? And how do you do it? And what are some of the benefits? And I realized that, you know, that's looking at things as if everything's going to work perfectly. Everything's going to be happy and dandy. And it's, you know, the real world, it's not always the case. Sometimes there are pitfalls, there are issues, there are problems. And the two problems that I typically see is that there's an issue of work balance. Two people come together, 
and they think that everything's going to be 50-50. You know, one person does the development, one person does the design, and there's going to be a kind of a balance of what's going on. And all of a sudden, the developer might find himself having to handle a lot more work, or the designer might find that there's a lot more complexity to what you're working on than you'd first anticipated. And there's the idea of responsibility. If you bring someone on to work as the direction side of things, and suddenly they're having to step into the design area or step into the development area and handle those other things, you know, that could be quite frustrating for them because they thought they were working on one thing and they could end up working on two or three at a time. So these to me are the two really big problems that you can encounter. There's things that spider out from that that are kind of knock-on of consequences of this. So I looked at these and kind of thought about what would the solutions be? I've not really encountered these problems myself. I've been very fortunate in that regard. But whenever I thought about them, the, the things that really stood out for me is that you should t research the people you're considering working with. You're not going to just work with someone out of the blue. You, I mean, if you're going to be investing a significant amount of your time and amount of your effort into producing something, you want to know who you're working with. Because, you know, there's some crazy people out there. And you want to make sure that you document things. Whenever you're doing work for a client, you get a contract, you put that in place. If there's a team of you working for a client, again, you get a contract and you put that in place. Whenever you're building a service or a program, you don't really think about that, but it's something that needs to be done because it's what makes sure that everyone knows exactly what's going on, who's handling what, and it allows you to document what happens if something does go wrong, if someone's suddenly having to do more than they're meant to be. But it's not enough to just have that document in place. You really need people to sit there, sit down, read it over, and sign it. A contract without a signature doesn't mean anything. Same thing with any documentation you have with a team. And those were the solutions that I came up with to the problems that I find could happen. So just to wrap up, I originally talked a little bit about the what of collaboration, why you'd collaborate with people, how you'd collaborate, and then finally I took a bit of a look at the pitfalls and how you could overcome them. Thank you very much. Is anyone up for a wee pint? Um, I should have said that we're going to do four talks tonight, which are about 10 to 15 minutes long. So normally in Refresh, we would do one person. But tonight, we're doing a slightly different format with four people. Um, and we're trying to cover what we do in this audience from a range of perspectives, which is something we're very much focused on on the MA. Um, so the designer entrepreneur, uh, Johnny Hall. Johnny joined us on the MFA after studying uh, graphic design at Glasgow School of Art, uh, a university with a, a, an art school with a very good reputation. Anyone else study there? Just the two of us, Johnny. That's where the awesome is. Whilst on the MFA, he has focused on the changing role of graphic designers. So we, we understand designers as being somebody who undertakes a service for somebody. They, they're asked to do something. They're asked to make things look pretty, or they're asked to solve certain problems. Um, he has started to look at how graphic designers have moved from providers of a service towards a position as entrepreneurs. He's currently in the process of setting up a web-based studio stroke gallery, where he is going to be selling his wares in the very near future. So give it up for Johnny Hall. Thank you. Hello there. Um, as Chris mentioned, my background is in graphic design, but uh, like many recent graduates of graphic design, I've chosen to follow a different path than the traditional route into the industry. Uh, traditionally, the graphic design industry has been a service industry providing design solutions to meet the requirements of companies, as I've represented here with a screenshot from uh, Mad Men. Um, this definition is becoming increasingly redundant no longer resigned to rearranging the words and images of others on screen, graphic designers are increasingly choosing a path of creative freedom, giving form to their own ideas. This self-initiated work is often to support freelance practice within the industry, or as the designer's sole practice and income. A contributing factor to this may be the lack of jobs in these uh, financial, tough financial times, but it is clear that the traditional boundaries between creative disciplines are being blurred to the point of invisibility. Um, although the desire for graphic designers to give form to their own ideas is not a new phenomenon, there's certainly been a growing movement in recent years of designers making and selling their own products for sale. 
uh, selling conventional pr uh, printed items such as uh, art prints, t-shirts, cards, uh, to more unexpected products such as hand-painted axes. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to a few examples of graphic designers who have carved their own path. Uh, the work you see here is by an English designer uh, by the name of Anthony Burrell, who has uh, made a name for himself um, producing these typographic prints, often with using vintage le wooden letterpress type, uh, with these enigmatic slogans often written by Anthony himself or from conversations he has overheard. Um, he exhibits around the world, and his unique styles won him commercial clients also, um, such as um, The Economist, the British Library, and London Underground. And uh, printmaking is an important part of Burrell's practice, and he creates, uh, and the slogans such as uh, shown here, uh, such as work hard and be nice to people, have become mantras for the design community and beyond. <coughs> This is the work of Crisp and Finn, which is a design partnership and online store founded by designer Anna Fidalgo and artist Roger Kelly. They produce a range of design products from prints to t-shirts and tote bags, all in a very strict blue, white and red color scheme. Anna and Roger founded Crisp and Finn over their shared love of, of ephemera, and they print most of their products by hand, so you could say it's a real, a real labor of love for them. The success of their collaboration has led to many commission projects and editorial work, but they also continue to work individually in their respective fields. Um, this is present and correct. Um, it's a London-based online store which was founded in 2008 and specialises in hand-printed stationery items such as notebooks and cards, prints and also uh, an eclectic range of vintage items. Uh, initially founded as a side project to the founders' jobs in graphic design studios uh, as an outlet to share their love of, of stationery and the vintage items they'd gathered, uh, Present and Correct has now become their sole income of the designers behind it. Uh, now, Jessica Hish is probably uh, someone a lot of you know. Um, she is a San Francisco-based designer, illustrator, and letterer. And she's made a, a real name for herself with her unique brand of uh, lettering and illustration. She, she works with a wide range of commercial clients, but self-initiated side projects are, are a very important part of what she does. Um, here I've shown her online store selling uh, letterpress prints of her daily drop cap project which was a side project of hers, where she would produce a different drop cap every day. I don't know if she did them actually every day, but um, for the whole alphabet. Um, I think Jessica is a good example of the importance of self-initiated work and how the f freedom of experimentation with personal ideas and opinions can feed back into commercial practice and can open up opportunities for designers that they may not have found otherwise. Uh, this is Best Made Company. Is Best Made Company is a, an online store founded by New York City-based graphic designer Peter Buchanan Smith. Now, despite uh, being a very successful and award-winning graphic designer, uh, B Buchanan Smith left behind client work in 2009 to go alone to launch Best Made Company with his range of lovingly designed and handmade and painted axes, as you see here. Um, he, he left behind a yeah, very successful career and guaranteed income to launch the company, and thankfully the risk is paid off for him as a range of outdoor products, as you can see here, and uh, screen-printed vintage maps, etc., have been extremely popular and won him a lot of plaudits. Um, best, best made company are actually running a workshop at Build, which maybe some of you are attending the the workshop, an axe restoration workshop, although it's not Buchanan Smith himself running it, I believe. Um, so I've got a quote here from Peter Buchanan Smith. He says, uh, when it came to Best Made, it was a really fascinating process because I could do everything. I could craft a story, create the Best Made world, and develop the product. I think that is the fun and the tricky part, but if you're a designer, you're totally equipped. Now, what's interesting about much of the work I've shown you is that they're 
it's our tr traditional processes at the heart of a lot of the work these designers are producing. Now, processes that have been, have been written off previously as, you know, de archaic and, and dead, you know, um, on the way out, such as layer press, screen printing, you know, these handcrafted goods. And there, there's many reasons for the resurgence of craft and growing popularity of the, the handmade in graphic design. It, it could be said that these traditional techniques are, are new techniques to the young graphic designer and offer an opportunity away from the, the default of the computer screen. But, uh, sorry, uh, the fact that many graphic designers are embracing this process uh, is, pardon me, is a symptom of a society becoming increasingly dependent on technology. It's a, it's a natural human desire to make with our hands, and there's an emotional connection with the designer with something lovingly produced by hand, and a physicality which can't be replicated on screen. This could be seen as a, as a rejection of the digital, but the web is, is at the heart of this designer-maker phenomenon, as it, as it provides a global outlet for the design products of such individuals. As, as the internet has made it easier to connect to the world, it has provided designers with a, a global audience for their ideas and creative output. And through personal websites, uh, social networks, blogs, um, designers are able to connect with a wider, wider com design community where they can share inspiration and opinions and find outlets and opportunities to make concepts reality. This can open new streams of revenue for the designer that they may not have thought available before, be it through writing, curating, or s selling prints of their artwork. Now, the idea of being in complete creative control seems to be a significant step, a significant factor for those designers who decide to pursue their own enterprise. To have complete creative freedom not afforded by client work is a concept that resonates with me and my plans for my master's project. Uh, I'm currently working on building a, a website, as, as Chris mentioned, um, which will operate as a, as a store selling limited edition prints of my work and that of others, as well as serving as a, a studio for uh, client work. Now, the name I uh, came up with this uh, studio store is Opening Hours. Um, I chose the name to represent a, a sort of physicality of the objects that interest me or that uh, you know, we sell it, it's all about, and it's, it's sort of playing the fact that the the web is, of course, you know, 24/7, um, you know, doesn't close. Uh, but when I was trying to, looking for a domain name to register, obviously started looking for the .com, which was taken, and then I sort of just came up with this idea and discovered I could get the domains of AM and PM. AM is Armenia, I think, and PM are some obscure French-owned yeah. islands of the coast of Canada somewhere. Um, so I like this idea of having two sides to it, because I've spoken about like client work and you know your personal work, producing work for yourself and your own ideas. So there's, I'm, I'm working with the idea of, of the, the two sides and playing with that. Now to show a bit of my own work, um, I do both jobs for, for clients, such as these sort of flyers shown here and uh, personal illustration and design work. It's just some handmade collages, collages by myself, which I have exhibited and sold prints of through outlets in the past. And uh, a, a very particular idea of the aesthetic um, of, that appeals to me and is consistent through both my personal work and my design for clients. And this is something I want to, to share with, with the Opening Hours project. As, as I mentioned earlier, as Peter Buchanan Smith said, uh, in the quote from Peter Buchanan Smith of Best Made Company, he said about uh, building a world around Best Made Company. And with opening hours, I plan to create a world around my interests and the objects and work that inspires me. Uh, I'm attracted to the idea of having complete curatorial control of the work I sell through the website and how I present this to the world through the web. So this is just a photo of some of the stuff I have in my studio. Uh, I'm working with uh, Johnny Campbell, who many of you know, on uh, building the website. And uh, as I mentioned before, the idea of building a world around a brand, I think, is very important. And the concept of there being two sides with the, the AM and the PM. And one idea I wish to explore is uh, with this is uh, the foe of the foe of the studio. And we discussed uh, throughout the day. If you visit the website at different times, the, the photo can change at different hours, like different things will happen. So if you visit in the morning, 
you know, there's, uh, there's coffee there. You know, you could be working in the afternoon or you go back at night and it's, it's the light's on and there's people there having a beer. And, and another idea we discussed, you, you can explore the studio. And what, uh, this idea I spoke about, uh, the world around opening hours, you, you could explore the studio. So if you click on things in the photo, it can take you to online exhibitions of different collections of, of mine or links to social networks and such like. Um, uh, this is a mock-up for the store. And as, I, as I mentioned, the store, I will sell prints by myself. Um, friends and friends I studied with before in Glasgow and, and work of, of people I admire. And uh, I'll be attending the Shopify workshop on, in mid-November, which I'm sure will become very useful for building the store. And one idea we discussed for the store was that it would only be open from nine to five. So you actually visit that after five, you couldn't buy anything, you couldn't go into the store. So, uh, and if you went after five, that would take you to the PM side of the site and you could explore the studio and there'd be plenty of material there to explore. Now, although this is a unique selling point, I don't know if it's necessarily a great idea to just close the store for <laughs> half the day, um, but, awesome. you know, these are ideas we've been playing with anyway, so. Another idea was a blind or a shutter could just come down at five o'clock. So if you're on at five, but you, you could you could always open it again. You know, you, you could break in. You know. <laughs> <clears throat> and so the plan is to have this site up and running in about three weeks' time. So uh, by about mid-November. Now the nature of this project is it won't be fully polished to start with, and will develop naturally as as time goes on. It's a, an ever-evolving concept uh, there. Um, so, if you visit the site right now, you can join a mailing list, which I encourage you all to do. And if, if whoever joins the mailing list over today or tomorrow, uh, I'll pick someone at random and they can win an exclusive print by me. Um, so if you join the mailing list or if you follow on Twitter, um, yep, yeah, someone can win an excellent print. This print shown here. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to leave you with a quote here from esteemed graphic design writer and critic Stephen Heller from his essay, Authorship in the Digital Age. Um, he says, with our design skills, we often make other people's notions come to life, so why not our own? And we're closed. So we've had two of the MFA students talking. Uh, we now have two more. Um, I think it's interesting the talks are all quite different. Uh, the next up is Pauline Clancy. She's going to be talking about language and typography. Pauline joined us on the MFA after a period working in industry. She uh, was working as a designer for Design Factory in Dublin. And she came up to uh, meet me to possibly come and talk on the course, uh, to, to not talk on the course, to actually study on the course. She's talked on the course probably as well. Um, and she showed me some stuff, uh, some of her work, and I said, this is amazing. Um, I would buy that. And she was like, do you think you would? And I was like, yeah, totally. And I'm sure you'll see when you see the work that she shows at the end. It's really, really nice. Um, she has, on the MFA, focused on the relationship between language and typography. She's also been creating some really wonderful silkscreen prints. So she learned to print using the medium of the silkscreen, old fashioned stuff. Um, and she's been creating some beautiful stuff. And I was talking to Jessica Hish in uh, Brooklyn Beta, at Brooklyn Beta, uh, two weeks ago, and Jessica, thinks that Pauline's prints are awesome. So give it up for Pauline Clancy. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, so this evening, I'm just going to do a short presentation on language and typography. And I'm just going to break it down into a few sections. So I'm briefly going to look at how language evolves from culture, how typography is bound to technology, and how some of this research has influenced my recent work. So our world of communication is constantly changing and evolving. New languages are created and learned to expand communication across many diverse areas. And this can result in some words that we have already associated meaning to are now given a new additional meaning. The purpose for any language is to communicate and to transfer meaning from one person to another, where the conventions of the language are identified and understood. So once you have an agreement in place that this stands for this or that stands for that, 
a new language can form, and this can occur between two or three people or a small group once, once the rules are agreed. Because language is arbitrary. It's something that we learn. If we even take the image of a dog, the image remains the same across all languages, because for the most part, images can transcend languages. But the word representing that image changes depending on where you are in the world. The word does not bear any resemblance to the, to the animal it represents, and so the meaning of the word and its association to the thing it represents is something that we learn. Typography is the visual form of language, and our alphabet has Greek origins, which was modified by the Romans to form the alphabet that we know today. So there's also the, the possibility of a link to Egyptian hieroglyphs. For example, it's thought that originally the A that we have was an ox's head, and over time this was modified through different cultures and time periods to become what we, what we see as an A today. In terms of global languages, Chinese and Arabic are spoken by more than half of the world's population, yet these are languages that we have trouble comprehending. For most of us, the symbols don't mean anything because we haven't learned the meaning associated with them. But in fact, we communicate in Arabic every single day because the numbers we use are Arabic numbers. And these are also known as Indian numerals because the Arabs obtained them from India and they entered the scribal tradition of Europe in the, in the 14th, 13th century. So they're introduced for accountancy purposes. So th this crossing of languages or languages lending themselves to one another frequently occurs. So for example, we all know the ampersand, and it means and. But if we break it down, it's actually a ligature of two characters, e and t, which is the word et, which is the Latin for and. So again, this crossing of languages is very much a reflection of an evolving society, because typography, it doesn't happen in isolation, but it's, it's a reflection of the time and the place it's created. And this is true, too, for its relationship to technology. For many, the birth of typography came with the invention of the printing press in the 1450s. And before this, the majority of books were written and copied by hand. And because these processes were so labor-intensive, books were extremely expensive and only the rich could afford them. So this device made it possible for people, for the first time, for everyone to have access to books and information. And this, the 42-line Bible, which is one of the most important pieces printed on the press, um, its, its immediate historical significance was the spread of the Protestant religion across Europe. And if we look at the detail on the right, um, Gutenberg's type followed the form of the letter forms written by the scribes in Germany at that time, which was a Gothic black letter style. So another pivotal moment in the relationship between typography and technology was when the Apple Macintosh was launched in 1984. And for the first time, designers had this complete environment, if you like, for design, production, and output. And as a result of this new technology, digital typography emerged. And um, people like designers like Susanna Lichko became very much at the front of that, designing these new bitmap typefaces. And they're a reflection of the time and the place they were created and the technology used to create them. So not only has technology changed the methods that we communicate in, but it has also changed the language we communicate in. You could say that a new language has been created to communicate digitally that perhaps has more in common with the, the spoken word rather than the written word. Abbreviations have always been used to save space, even when the scribes were writing on vellum, because vellum was an expensive material, but now they're just used in a different format. So again, this reflects how a language evolves or changes in relation to changing technology and a changing society. So, as a, as a graphic designer or visual communicator, my interest lies in visual language and how we read it. So my previous research began with an exploration into semiotics and looking at aspects of our language. So since beginning my study on the MFA, my theoretical research has primarily been realized through the medium of screen printing. 
I really enjoy this process because I can develop a project, work with it, and for me, it feels like an appropriate medium for which I can realize my ideas. So I have produced some prints on typography and semiotics, and this was my first real attempt at screen printing. Um, so it was a, it's a visual exploration of the research I was working on in semiotics at that time. And semiotics can be, this, can be quite heavy and complex area, so for me, this was a way to try and get my head around it and to understand all that theory. So I just wanted to break down some of the elements that appear in my prints. Um, the terms and the theories that underpin visual communications are linguistics, which is the study of language, and semiotics, which is the science of signs and meaning. So I became very interested in this because I wanted to, to know how visual communication works. So one of the key people in semiotics is um, a guy called Ferdinand de Saussure, and he's a Swiss linguist. And his theories are formed around the signifier, the signified, and the sign. So he says the signifier is the physical evidence of the sign, so it's a word or an image. And the signified is the mental representation of that word or image. And a sign is the external reality or the meaning formed when the signifier and the signified are brought together. So if we relate this back to a previous slide on the dog, we, can see, we could say that the word dog is the signifier and the image created from that word is the signified. And the sign is formed when these two elements are brought together. But this relationship between the signifier and the signified, which is the word and the image it, it represents, it's something that we have to learn. So this research is reflected in my work, and this is some promotional cards that I produced from that. And this was another series of self-promotional cards, but this time I didn't want to create just another print, so, but wanted to do something wi different with it. So because it was a promotional piece, it also had to be easily portable. So I designed it so that it could be cut down into different sections and packaged, and the idea was that you could you could piece it together, sort of like a little puzzle. So then I became interested in exploring the structure of our language and how certain words or letters communicate. And, get, and again, these prints reflect my research into language. And there's the ampersand again. And the AE, which is um, another ligature. And I looked at other alphabetical alphabetical characters, which are graphemes, and they're the smallest, the smallest unit in, in written language. So these, these are all in, very interesting elements for me to explore. So I'm not only interested in the finished, in the finished pieces, but also the process involved. I don't know, when, you, when you screen print, you, you do test sheets on newsprint to, to make sure you can get a clean print. And so I don't throw anything away. I collect all these test sheets, and. I just bound them together at the end of last year, of the last semester. And for me, they have really nice elements of overprinting and irregularities. And I just find them really interesting because they've, they've recorded the whole process. So at the moment, I'm researching for my final um, FM, MFA project, and, which is an exploration of the Irish printed word. So I'm looking forward to, to moving on with my research in that and hopefully produce another series of um, screen prints in that area. So thank you for listening. Cheers. Beautiful. Really nice. You can buy them. They're not that expensive. You should buy them. And I think we're going to have some prizes at the open book exam of these prints, which are really beautiful. So now we're going to move on to Kyle Gawley. Uh, Kyle is the last of the people presenting tonight on the MFA uh, showcase. Um, Kyle did this talk for us um, as a presentation that we do at the university, where at the end of uh, one of the modules, uh, the students have to come in and present on something. And I threw down a challenge to Kyle, and I said to him, uh, you could do a talk that you've done a million times before. You could do the typical talk with 20 slides, and you could do that because you know you can do that. Uh, but what would be a challenge would be if you did a crazy, insane talk which involves snorting vast amounts of cocaine. Um, well, not that I would recommend anybody do that on the MFA. Uh, snorting vast amounts of cocaine and doing this crazy-ass talk which has got literally 100-odd slides, and you do that in 10 minutes. Um, and I said to Kyle, then there's a risk here. 
Okay? You can either pull this off or it can go horribly wrong. Um, but if you pull it off, I think it will be awesome. And Kyle, to his credit, said, you know, I've done these talks for 20 slides. I I'll give this a go. And he came in and he did this talk to uh, Debbie Fraser and myself. And we gave him some marks for that because that's what we give on the MA, we give marks. And uh, I thought this is a great talk and other people should hear it. Um, and it's about 100 steps to a successful digital startup. Kyle joined us on the MFA from our MD course, so he studied with some of you guys at undergraduate level. Um, whilst on the MFA, his focus has been on the design of a number of digital products, so he's worked on a variety of different things. He's also working on Get Invited, the ticketing application that we are currently building. Uh, he's also done CSS Bear, an awesome Bear, Bear CSS, a Bear that does CSS. You need a bear on your team that can do CSS. That's a good thing. Um, last year, he was one of a handful of designers to attend Stanford University's prestigious eBoot Camp in San Francisco. Uh, I can't stress enough how much of the, an achievement that was. There were 30 places kept over for people from the world, not from America. Um, and I said to a bunch of the guys on the course, you should apply for this, um, because I think you could, you could get it, and I think it would be a good thing for you to do. And he applied, and Kitty, who's here, made a video for him. Uh, thank you, Kitty. Uh, if you need any video, Kitty, on the MFA, she'll sort you out. Um, and he went to San Francisco as this mild-mannered guy who was working quite slowly, in my eyes, and he came back like he had snorted a whole bunch of cocaine, He'd taken some acid, and he'd done like a whole bunch of drugs as well. And he came back a different guy, um, and it was amazing. So he's going to do this presentation, which is kind of like Petra Kucha on speed. Um, and he's going to tell you everything you need to know about establishing a digital startup. So give it over to Kyle Gawley. Thank you. Um, thank you. OK, so my talk tonight is called um, 0 to 1.0, 100 Steps to a Successful Digital Startup. And this is going to incorporate some of the things that I've learned um, when I was in America and some of the things I've learned along the way um, building some of my own products. So here's some of the things that we're going to be covering. Um, <laughs> these are just some of the things that you need to know if you're going to be um, building a web app or trying to set up an online business. So the first thing then, if you want to create a product, you want to set up um, your own startup, is you need an idea. Where do you get an idea? Well, you discover a problem. This could be one of your own problems, or it could be a problem that you've observed other people having. And then you create a solution to that problem. So you go out, you talk to people, um, you brainstorm, you think about it. But that's the easy part. Um, to actually turn this idea into a real product or into a real thing, it's going to cost you some money. Um, and the cost of this can vary. So if you need a team, you're going to have to pay them a salary. The team are going to have to work from somewhere, so you're going to have to rent the premises. Um, you'll also need to consider legal fees if you're going to be employing people, if you're going to go into business with other people, or if you're going to be doing things like um, handling customers' money. You'll need to get some legal advice to cover your own back. Um, if you've created something really new and innovative, you might want to patent the technology. And if you don't have it already, you'll have to buy some software, so you might need a copy of Xcode or Photoshop or Coda. And if you're going to be relying on third-party services, this is going to cost you money as well. So things like Typekit, or if you're going to be using a payment gateway for processing payments. Um, if you're delivering an application online, you're going to have to pay for some server space. Um, you might also need to consider referrals. So if you're going to be launching an application in a marketplace, such as the App Store, these people are going to take um, a percentage of um, each sale. And you also need to be aware of the cost of scaling as well. So as your product grows, your team's going to grow, you're going to have to pay them more money. Um, you're going to have to start paying for more um, hosting space as you demand more bandwidth and storage. So once you've worked out your costs, then you need to raise some money to cover this. So where do you get money? Well, you could take out some credit cards. You'd be in debt for a while, but um, at least you'd own 100% of the business yourself. You could sell some equity, or sometimes you can exchange some equity for a team member to get somebody else on board. This can be a good idea if you get somebody with um, some good skills and they're more likely to be invested in the business if they own a stake in it. You could go to a venture capital firm. Um, this can be good because um, you'll get access to some really good networks and good advice, but again, you're going to lose some um, equity in the business. A good idea is to try and find an angel. These are people who really believe in what you're doing. Um, you know, they think your product's a great idea, so they'll give you money to help you get it off the ground. This can sometimes be your mom or your brother or your sister. 
So when you've got some money then, you need to put a team together. You're going to need at least a designer, a developer, and a salesperson. But sometimes these people can wear multiple hats. So sometimes the designer could be going out and selling the product, or it could be like a one-man band scenario where you're doing everything yourself. And with your team then, you can start to, you need to create something tangible. So you need to start thinking about designing your product. You're going to need um, a brand, some, some way people can recognize you and your company. You'll also need to consider things like user experience, um, emotion and psychology, how your product's going to make people feel, um, user interface design, and of course, responsive design, so your product works across different devices. You'll also need to consider copywriting so that your product has um, a particular language you're at a, the, right, the right tone. Um, and of course, this design process should be integrated with um, your development process into this iteration-based agile approach. And you'll need to answer questions like, is, are you going to create a web app or a native app? If you're creating a web app, you'll need somebody who's proficient with HTML and CSS, the various front-end technologies, but who can also program, so they can use jQuery, PHP, or Ruby. If you're going down the mobile route, you'll need somebody who can code in Objective-C, but then this won't work on Android, so you'll need somebody who can code in Java as well. <laughs> Or you could um, use a solution like PhoneGap, so you can deliver to multiple platforms. You create your um, app in HTML and JavaScript, and then you can distribute it to iPhone and Android. And you need to create a prototype as quickly as possible, and then test this out with real users. Where do you get real users? Um, you can invite people to come and try your beta, and this will attract early adopters. Um, people who love to try the latest trend or the latest product. These people will give you really good feedback and advice, and they'll also talk about your product to other people to help you sell it. Um, so once you've created a project, a product then, you need to think about how you're going to monetize it. So you'll need a revenue model. Um, there's various things available for this. So traditional software sales were based on asset sales. You could walk into a shop, um, you pay a fixed price for a piece of software, you take that home, and then you own that for um, life. But with the web, there's much more um, innovative models about. For example, freemium, where we have two sets of users, a free set of users, and then a set of um, paying users. Um, so the majority of users are getting access to the product for free. And then we have a different set of users who are paying for advanced or different features that subsidize the cost of the free users. And a good um, example of this is advertising, where the majority of the users are using the product for free, and then the advertisers are then paying for the advertising space, and they cover the cost of the free users. So this is how things like Facebook and um, Google work. Or you could go for a subscription cost, where people um, either pay a weekly, monthly, or a yearly fee to access your service. Um, on demand has become quite popular as well, where people just pay for what they want um, when they need it. But before anyone gives you any money, they're going to need to find value in your product. So you need to work out what your value propositions are. Um, this could be performance. It could be you're offering the smartest, fastest solution out there. Or maybe you've created something that's really new and innovative. Or you're letting your customers customize the product to suit their own needs. Or perhaps you're just offering the cheapest solution out there. Um, or you might be offering the most convenient solution that um, allows people to perform a task um, as easy or as quickly as possible. Or perhaps you've created the best quality product out there that people are prepared to pay more for. So you need to think about attracting some customers after that. To do this, you'll need to do some promotion. Um, for that, you'll need a strategy. A really good strategy is Roger's diffusion of innovations, where you identify sneezers and mavens, people who will go out and talk about your product for you, um, who will help sell it and, and draw other people in. In order to meet these people, you might need to identify some connectors, people who have a really strong connection within their social network and can introduce you to the people that um, you need to know. Uh, create a blog and start talking about your product, start talking about your company values. Um, this will also open up a direct communication channel with your customers where you can talk to them directly. Um, consider SEO so that people can find you online. Uh, create a video advertisement, um, post it on your um, product page, show people using your product, show it in uh, real scenarios, put it, in, put it on YouTube, put it on Vimeo, because these are really um, good uh, free advertising platforms. Talk about your products on social networks, on Facebook and Twitter. Um, create advertisements, whether this is online or in traditional um, mediums, such as magazines or TV campaigns. And hopefully this will allow you to attract some customers then. But you need to work out who these people are. Um, what age are they? What? <laughs> it's the same key code. 
Um, where are they from? Um, and how do you find all this information out? Well, you could use surveys or questionnaires, um, analytic tools to try and find out what kind of people are coming to your website. Um, use social networks um, to see who's talking about your product online. And you need to determine what kind of relationships you're going to have with your customers. It might just be an off-the-shelf relationship where they pay, somebody pays you money for the product, they take it away, and there's no interaction unless the customer's giving you um, feedback or they have a problem. But that's not um, the best approach. You at least need to have some kind of automated service where you're kind of guiding people to get set up with your product. Um, the best relationship you can have then is have a personal relationship with your users. And you can do this through various channels such as Facebook, um, Twitter, Google Plus, or in real life. Go out and talk to your, um, your users at conferences, workshops, and events. And also consider your distribution channels, how, you're gonna, um, how people are going to get your product. If it's a web application, it's most likely going to be from your own um, server space. Or if it's a mobile app, you might be distributing in an app store, such as um, Apple's App Store or Amazon. Um, you also need to be aware of your competition. You need to identify these people and determine what market share they have and how you're going to um, how you're going to capture this from them. Well, you're going to do that through your value propositions, which we talked about earlier. But you might be at a disadvantage if your competitors have been in the market for a while. Um, they have very strong traction. They've got a good user base. But your advantage is you're smaller, you're much more agile, so you can pivot to adapt the market needs much easier. And you can also learn from your competitors' mistakes. So you've created a product, you've got a team, you're making money, um, everything's going really well. The next thing you need to do is you need to grow the business. And you do this by increasing your market share. Um, you can reach new customers within your current market, um, so you can expand. If you've got a web app, um, consider creating a mobile app, or you could diversify. Um, create new products, they enter different market segments or enter new markets all together. And most importantly, turn your customers into brand evangelists, people who will go out and talk about your product and sell it for you. And you do this by creating something that people love, something that people love so much they want to go out and get all their friends to use it too. And above all else, you've got to have the right attitude. I know this is a bit of a cliche, but you need to accept this idea of failure and don't let it put you off, um, and don't let it put you off doing anything. Um, learn from your mistakes, learn from other people, and have self-belief. So if you don't believe in what you're doing or what you're building, then nobody else is going to believe in it either. And think differently. You can see the world in a unique way, and you can solve problems in, only way, in a way that only you can. And there's value in that. So, and most importantly then, you have to start. If you don't start doing anything, you won't achieve anything. So just to sum up, here's the things that uh, we've covered. And this is really just to give you an idea that if you're building a web app, you're creating a digital product, um, there's much more to it than simply just um, designing a website. So thank you very much for listening. If you want to follow me on Twitter, there's my username.